Hey, it's Lou, and here's the thing. Tech is full of copycats. As soon as an exciting app or service comes out, there are a slew of imitators. Meanwhile, the core four in the space, Facebook, Google, Amazon, and Apple, try to gobble up new innovations. One expert told me when evaluating a promising new company, the behemoths have the choice to build, buy, or kill. That is, create their own version, buy the existing one, or make an effort to squash the startup before it gains any traction through legal or even illegal means. And the truth is, there's not much a startup could do to defend itself, except hope for a buyout. Originality alone is rarely rewarded. Full disclosure, this was going to be a piece about the decline of Snapchat. The app's growth has recently weakened, in large part because of a deeply unpopular redesign that pissed off users. Over a million people signed a petition criticizing the new look and functionality of the app, and the company was forced to undo many of those changes. Worse, from a marketing perspective at least, celebrity influencers started shit-talking Snap, including Chrissy Teigen and Rihanna. A single negative tweet from the confusingly powerful Kylie Jenner set the company's stock tumbling by $1.3 billion. These are all setbacks, but the big blow came back in 2016 at the hands of Instagram, which mimicked Snapchat's story feature. I mean, they literally have the same name. And they even copied Snapchat's big differentiating features. The fact that these stories disappear and that you could spice them up with emojis and filters and other bits of augmented reality. Since Instagram introduced these borrowed attributes, they've grown while Snapchat has struggled. So I wondered, did Instagram, owned by tech giant Facebook, rob Snapchat of the things that made it special? Miranda Kerr, supermodel wife of Snapchat CEO Evan Spiegel, expressed a similar thought about Facebook, saying, can they not be innovative? Do they have to steal all of my partner's ideas? It turns out these questions are largely irrelevant. In tech, everyone is a thief and there's no real effort to hide it. At an internal meeting in the summer of 2016, Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg reportedly told his employees, don't let pride get in the way of serving users, which led to an in-house slogan, don't be too proud to copy. The company apparently took the message to heart. In the last few years, Facebook has launched or announced a variety of features that resemble the work of other companies, even big brands like Tinder, Periscope, Slack, and Foursquare. There's even reports that a Facebook-owned company called Onovo, a VPN service, is actually designed to track what mobile apps people are using. In this way, Facebook has an early bird warning system that gives them a heads up. Hey, people like this new app. They're spending a lot of time on it. Maybe we should consider creating our own version. As an outsider, and let's be honest, a frequent Facebook critic, this seemed wrong to me. So I spoke to Eric Goldman, a professor at Santa Clara University School of Law, and asked him how smaller companies can prevent the Facebooks of the world from stealing their ideas. In a classic lawyer move, he objected to the use of the word steal. That's got moral and legal dimensions, he explained. I get his point. Steal makes it sound like Facebook is a burglar in the night, lifting specific code from locked safes. Instead, Goldman framed the issue as copying and pointed out that copying is prevalent across many industries, from fashion to video games. And really, copying caters to consumer needs. We get more options, and because there are more options, we get better pricing or cooler features or whatever. Stav Weissman, an entrepreneur who advises tech startups, also pointed out consumers don't care who's first. They care about what product is best, what product is the easiest to use, and the most enjoyable. That's why Snapchat's redesign was such a step back. It confused a lot of people. Still, what about the poor innovator who had the idea first, but got ripped off by the imitators? Well, Goldman told me there are patents, of course, and you can protect trade secrets through non-disclosure agreements, but both those options are really expensive and time-consuming. Plus, the tech giants have ultra-powerful legal departments that will make your life hell. Because of those enforcement issues, Weissman told me that NDAs aren't even worth the paper they're printed on. Now, that sounds like shitty news for an emerging entrepreneur, but the industry veterans I spoke to offered analysis that amounted to tough luck it's the lay of the land. Get over it and create something better. Steve Blank, an esteemed entrepreneur and Stanford professor, told me it's no secret that large tech companies like Facebook, Google, and Amazon are going to try to mimic new innovations in their respective spaces. Entrepreneurs who think otherwise are naive and unprepared. It's been going on forever. In fact, when Steve Jobs accused Bill Gates of stealing ideas from Apple in the 1980s, Gates reportedly replied, 
Well, Steve, I think there's more than one way of looking at it. I think it's more like we both had this rich neighbor named Xerox, and I broke into his house to steal the TV set and found out that you had already stolen it. By the way, Jobs sent mixed messages about copying and stealing. He famously said, Good artists copy, great artists steal. But Jobs is also quoted as saying, I'm going to destroy Android because it's a stolen product. I'm willing to go thermonuclear war on this. I will spend my last dying breath if I need to, and I will spend every penny of Apple's $40 billion in the bank to right this wrong. That inconsistency within Jobs is sort of reflective of the larger reality that everything is derivative and everyone's a hypocrite. I mean, how can Slack complain about Facebook Workplace, for instance, when Slack is just sort of a chat room anyway? But I digress. The challenge for a tech startup is to create a defensible company, something that is so unique and special that has such a strong relationship with its users that it can either survive the inevitable competition from one of the tech behemoths or be attractive enough to be bought by one of them. That's a very common exit strategy. Consider WhatsApp. Facebook stocked with some of the best coders, engineers, and designers in the world. And not to mention having nearly unlimited financial resources, could have easily created a product that was a WhatsApp ripoff. Probably even a better version. But WhatsApp had built a brand that attracted nearly half a billion people. So instead of trying to build it, Facebook decided to buy it for $19 billion. Now, with regards to Snapchat, Facebook tried both the build and buy it approach. An ill-fated Facebook product called Poke was pretty clearly a Snapchat wannabe. When it failed, Zuckerberg went the buy route, but Spiegel resisted and ultimately rejected Zuckerberg. The shady way that went down and the ensuing rivalry between the two is common fodder for tech gossip, and many believe Zuckerberg has so relentlessly pilfered Snap's features because of the bad blood. Or perhaps Zuckerberg is simply obsessed with innovation, bent on continually updating Facebook and its portfolio of companies so that it remains an essential part of its users' lives. One could argue that despite his success and historic wealth, it's Zuckerberg who's still the hungriest, who's always worried about an existential threat to his company, a new startup that will do to Facebook what he did to MySpace. Spiegel, well, he's got a party boy image. Perhaps his priorities lie in enjoying his wealth. No judgments there. Interestingly, Blank, that entrepreneur I mentioned earlier, once had an idea stolen from him. Not just the idea, but also the actual slides. His presentation was literally copied. He pointed out, though, that they may have stolen the static original concept, but he was able to evolve it and take it in a new direction. Even more important than the idea, he told me, is the ability to learn fast and make quick adjustments. Innovation is a process, not a plateau. Besides, sympathy is in short supply in Silicon Valley. And as Blank told me, the winners get to write history. Others fear the winners will dominate the future and create monopolies that not only discourage innovators and startups, but create market conditions where the major players can slowly jack up the price. Amazon Prime is getting more expensive, for instance. On the other hand, Professor Goldman points out that independent companies have recently risen to success. He gave Pinterest as an example. And there's a lot of venture capital money floating around that is entrusted to new players. Now, it might be intimidating to try and out-innovate the Googles and Facebooks of the world, but keep in mind, small startups have some advantages. Smaller teams are more nimble, have a shorter feedback loop, and are not bogged down by bureaucratic tendencies. Believe me, idea generation is often stifled by the endless meetings and consensus seeking at large companies. Well-paid executives tend to embrace the status quo. So if you've got a great idea, Get to market quickly and start benefiting from the first mover advantage. As everyone scrambles to catch up with you, you should have a nice lead. But you got to keep running, keep heading in new directions, because the chase is on and it will never stop. Okay, I'm going to go live my life. I used to be on Snapchat all the time, but then I got a new phone and it never occurred to me to re-download it and I don't miss it.